Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Film Festival Mastery Podcast. I think this is episode four, right, guys? Right? Okay, sweet. Yeah, so man. I am with I am with John Fitzgerald and Paul June, John Fitzgerald of Awesomeness, uh, co-founder of Slam Dance, the current CEO, president, founder, emperor, god king of iGems.tv, <laughs> and uh, and then Paul June. A guy that I know. No, he he's Just the CEO. Some, some dude. <laughs> some, some bro. Uh, co-founder of Filmocracy, the most awesomest streaming platform of all time. Um, that's also where we are hosting the visual piece of this podcast. We got a little... <laughs> I so needed that in my life. I'm even going to... I'm even going to make this tile different so people can see our little background. Uh, today we're in like a little little cafe setup, which feels like we're all in the same room together. Um, it looks like an outdoor cafe. Or yeah, I fancy. It's COVID friendly. By the way, I'm getting my it second uh, uh, invo- invoice uh, <laughs> immunization on <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Very excited. I will then be... I mean, guys, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to still sit in my basement and do nothing, but I'll, I'll at least pretend that I can. Uh, all right. So let me guys. Let me tell I you got guys. mine this week, too, for inquiring minds. Well, you got the you got the one off, right? One and done. One and done. Paul, what about you? Hmm. I've got I've got half. So okay. I've gotten one shot waiting on the other shot. Um. For some reason, I was thinking this vaccine was going to cover me the rest of my life. So if I knew that I would have to get it all the time, then I probably would have gotten the one-shotter. Yeah. You guys must have snuck in somehow under the radar because you're not in the over 50 club, as far as I know. No, uh, I'm in the veterans club. Thank you. Ah. Oh, I'm in the uh, too heavy to be healthy <laughs> club. <laughs> They were like, hey, you're looking a little chunky. Come on in. You're probably going to need this. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> it's the first time this has benefited me. I'm going to take advantage of it. <laughs> oh, my Man. God. Uh, and, then, no, and, the, and then my wife uh, is uh, kind of working towards being a teacher. So she had the child care education thing. Essential worker thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we have a plane joining us today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very strong. John opinions. happens to live right next to the Santa Monica Airport, so that, that <laughs> happens from time to time. So you can go into present mode whenever you feel like it. Okay, brilliant. We'll uh, get real rid of quick, that. I'll read out this <laughs> this way. Although this is this this is recorded visually, so you guys can see this little uh, link here on the side. But for those of you listening in, um, it's https colon slash slash uh, events dot filmocracy dot com slash the letter E as an elephant. Another slash film hyphen festival hyphen mastery. I'm and sure it'll that's easy to remember. Link. And it'll always be that link. Um, maybe I'll come up with like some sort of forwarding thing in the future, like ffmpodcast.com. And it forwards to this. That's what we'll do. How about that? Okay. Well, we can also put it in the show notes. Oh, that's right. That podcasty show notes thing that I always forget is a thing. Uh, well, let's let's present and let's get into our subject for the day, shall we, gents? Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks, Paul, for the enthusiastic half nod. All right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, and and Paul and Paul and Paul. Once we go into present mode, can do that really fun tune. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There. Yeah. That's what it feels like. <laughs> Starting. <with Paul. laughs> All right. Here we go. I like the. We'll do that's it. <laughs> Start now. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That's so great. I'm so glad you contributed. Uh, all right. Let's get into our subject for the day. Um, John putting you on the spot any fun little one-off things you want to share with us before we get into whatever it is we're talking about uh yeah well i just i think in the last week or so there's been some some pretty cool announcements just you know top line festival circuit stuff new directors new films announced uh it's it's their 50th anniversary for anybody paying attention all right and uh they're gonna be doing a lot of different things uh uh, around New York and of course at the at the Lincoln Center. But um Tribeca also announced 
their slate, I believe. And they, Paul, I feel like they announced their slate, or maybe they just announced that they're going to be all over the boroughs of New York. Uh, yeah, I saw that one. Venues. Yeah, so a, a lot happening in New York, I think, was, was is the message of the day. Sweet. Yeah, no, I. Uh, it'd be nice to get up there soon, too. I used to go a couple times a year just to even just to teach the Lone Film Festivals, and, you know, that didn't happen. Yeah, and and new directors is is it starts April twenty eighth. It runs runs into the early part of May. Okay, and, and brilliant. Tribeca's in June. Brilliant. Wow. Yeah. So sweet. Don't don't you don't you owe oh, yeah, me, Paul? No, that was Owen Wilson. That wasn't me. Oh yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> uh, all right. So subject topic. Um, I've made I've made my screen too large um john do you want to you want to pull it up yeah uh, i think i what well, i think one of the one of the ideas i thought we'd talk a little bit about today is the idea of how filmmakers define success on the festival circuit mm. and how that might look a little different now we talked a little bit about kind of the, the state of the circuit just kind of as a macro concept and how everything kind of changed um, but we just kind of scratched the surface on a few ideas, and I thought it might be fun, as as filmmakers are are adjusting their schedules based on, you know, which festivals are purely virtual, which are live, and there's not that many li- fully live. I think mm-hmm. Telluride's one of the only, but um, and, and which ones are are doing a hybrid, and then the thing we talked about last week, the idea of of or two weeks ago maybe now, uh, of of kind of this whole membership thing and how long festivals are going to hang on to your film. But, but I think because festivals were this kind of farm system, this filter to kind of help film secure distribution. And obviously with the increase of streaming platforms, there's more distribution opportunities in some ways, Mm -hmm. but because of, of COVID how, how your strategy has been affected and and you may not do festivals now for a year, or you may decide, Mm -hmm. I don't want to wait six months until I can be in a theater with 25% capacity. So I just thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about what the definition of success is for, for filmmakers. And, and, and if we are going to kind of lean on technology now, right, since it's all about virtual, uh, or at least it's mostly about virtual, uh, may, you know, Paul can shed some light on some of the amazing things that are going on in filmocracy with, with the networking opportunities and, and the conferencing and all those kinds of things. So I just wanted to throw that out to kind of, kickstart the conversation yeah i think the um i think the success question is a really big one you know particularly for us um with film festival mastery and the coaching program we have with that and mentorship and all that kind of stuff like you know it's important that even just we know what it is we're trying to help bridge our students to and uh and you know we talk about this a lot it's always going to come back to goals knowing what your ultimate goal is. And then obviously I guess the easiest definition would be being able to check that goal off is a success. Um, But I think it's like you were saying, becoming a lot more nuanced and uh, planning out, even really deciding what your goals are, it kind of becomes this circular thing where you're informing yourself of your goals to help you make your goals. That made any sense at all. Um, I'm not that stoned. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, But yeah, so, you know, for me, like, as I'll I'll just kind of start with. (laughs) Smoke weed every day. Um, I'll be my own sound effect. Uh, (laughs) with, With short films, like, for me so far, it's been, you know, the goal for me with short films, of course, has been, like, getting the getting the name and the work out there in front of the industry. And so a lot of times my goals are getting into as high tier festivals as I possibly can, and then getting those laurels. And of course, hopefully winning some of these festivals or winning some of these, you know, categories or whatever, something like that. And so, you know, for me so far in the short film space, um, it's been that recently, however, with this last film, it was to secure distribution. I had an in with Gunpowder and Sky, so I knew that they would see it, but I didn't want to go to them empty handed. Like, hey, what if we just like skipped the festivals and you just took it? And so our initial wave of submissions was all towards festivals that would sort of 
um, reinforce the pet, the sci-fi pedigree of the film so that when I did take it to them, it was an easy yes for them. So already we're starting to getting into like a nuanced strategy beyond just quote, getting laurels or getting distribution. Um, John, what do you see with, with, you know, especially in the doc space and, and, well, I, yeah, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of filmmakers were, were using festivals to to earn some laurels and maybe even some awards and generate some buzz. Um, but I think the truth is that that the other thing that people look for was was the networking opportunities and traveling mm -hmm. to the festivals where you could meet other filmmakers, maybe even in some industry players. And I think if, if a, lot, a lot of that live is gone or it's not the same. And you're not going to be able to play it in a theater, see it on the big screen and do a live Q&A. Some of that goes away. And and because of all these streaming platforms now, sometimes it's not worth, it's, it's not worth stringing out a festival run when you can't really actively participate in the same way. So if you have companies that are reaching out to you and offering you a streaming opportunity, is it something you should take? And I think that that is happening more now than ever before. And there are online marketplaces that are buying and selling of movies that nobody's ever heard of because a lot of these movies didn't go the festival route. They just decided they wanted to sell them. So I, I think, you know, that's where filmocracy comes in, right? Because they offer a streaming platform. It's, it's, it's an interesting, fun, gamified streaming platform. But they're also providing services to festivals and they're having to to deal with a lot of these festivals that are streaming movies online, and and so I I do think, it, to me, for most filmmakers, it's honestly less about how much money I can make, and more about can I can I secure distribution that's going to put me in front of an audience. Yeah. But what people don't think about is if they if I if I put my movie up into iTunes and I get to tell my, my family that and my friends that I'm going to be on iTunes and nobody else knows about it, it's just going to sit there with the other, whatever, hundred thousand titles. So is it better to go with another company that has less films that, that might bubble to the top on the homepage or, or recommendation engines, you know? So these are questions that filmmakers have to ask, but, but, but neither of those scenarios, iTunes or, one of these other platforms is necessarily about about revenues. It's more about right. eyeballs, right? Paul, what do you think? Yeah, I think you guys always ask that very important question of, you know, what is your goal? And I think it's very easy to just kind of like let that pass over your head, like, oh yeah, it's just a thing people say. But really, this is a different world than it was 30 years ago. Like you being a filmmaker and making a movie are not particularly special in the world. Like there are so many people making movies. It's just become democratized. Everybody can make movies now. Many yeah. of them are terrible, some are good, but just the fact of making a movie doesn't give you an edge in any way. Like it's, it's rough out there. There's a lot of platforms, but for the most part, nobody is going to take your unknown film with your unknown face and spend a bunch of money to make you famous. So a lot of it rests on you. And do you want a lot of people watching it or do you want to feel like you're special and want to do you know special screenings and go down that route? That's definitely up to you. Um, but I always recommend if you're going to go on platforms, try to be non-exclusive and try to be as, as many places as you can because then it gives you the most opportunities because it's hard enough being on one platform and getting somebody to watch your film. Like if, if Justin had a film on Netflix, I probably still wouldn't watch it mm. just because mm. I don't know who that guy is. Like he's some dude in Kentucky. What do, what do I care about? Justin Giddings? So like Netflix is not spending a bunch of money to put Justin in the front page. Unfortunately, because his shit is good. Oops, I should have beat myself there. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> a delayed the beep. Delayed I love that. beep. Oh God! Please, can we make that a thing? Blame, blame the internet on censorship <laughs> delay. Oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's so, a good yeah. point. It's a good point. Yeah, I. Uh, so, you know, 
one day Netflix will 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 recognize the glory and the power. But until then, I understand, Paul, why you wouldn't want to watch any of my movies. <laughs> you butthead. <laughs> no, but I think that that's an important point too, though, which is like you've got these companies like Gravitas, uh, who finds out that a film got into you know a, a, a low to mid range festival and does a deal with the festival to get access to the emails. And they send blanket emails out to every film in that festival and say, we want your movie. There's no upfront money. We'll get you on iTunes and on Google play and on Amazon. And your revenue share is, you know, whatever 70, 30. And we want your movie for 10 or 15 years. And, and then you're done. And, and so a lot of these filmmakers don't know any better and they just assume that's a great deal and they're going to be on iTunes and that's a great deal. And they're going to get, 70% of, of what? And, and so I think it becomes increasingly important to understand when you start thinking about where you want your film to live. If you're not in that, you know, one to 5% of the, of the independent films that play, you know, in, in pole position at the top festivals, you know, it's a small number that there's, what did Sundance have in features last year? It was like 4,400 or something uh entered so of the 4400 that entered you know it, it's less than one percent of that number yeah that's going to find a deal at hbo netflix or hulu for example so you got to just make the assumption you might not be in that bucket <laughs> so if you're not in that bucket and you know you want to find an audience which streaming platforms make sense and which festivals matter to those platforms or do they Right. Or do you want to do you want to just go right into one of those platforms that has less films and that tells you that they're doing a special collection on, you know, whatever Black History Month or Women's History Month or wh whatever that whatever the niche might be that adds a little extra promotional bump to your title that gives you an opportunity to be to be recognized by their community? Is that is that as valuable or like you said earlier, uh, Justin, with the sci-fi, is that as valuable or more valuable than being able to tell everybody you're on iTunes or nobody's going to find you? I think in today's day and age, it's more valuable to be to connect with an actually interested audience um, because like from my marketing perspective, like you can leverage that, 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 that'll, that can help you advance your career when you can show the, the gatekeepers and the decision makers that like, look, I'm bringing an enthusiastic audience with me. That's a lot more interesting than I'm on iTunes with this film. Um, and so I'm always kind of thinking, how does this play into the next move? And I, you know, with YouTube, like we're kind of seeing Instagram influencers, like we're kind of seeing the value of being able to find and hopefully monetize an audience. And so if you can sh prove that, I think that has a lot more value than just, you know, I'm on iTunes or I'm on Amazon prime or, or something like that. Yeah. Do you want to be in a small pond and you are just one of the few highlighted koi fish in that pond or are you in the ocean? And I think for most of us, we're better suited to be in a pond where the environment is more controlled and it's mm. not full of predatory animals. Wow. This, this analogy is really this working. This is fantastic. Right? <laughs> I'm amazing uh, right now. This is great. <laughs> Pat yourself on the back. Wait, I've got something for that. Wow. <laughs> no, that's just first off. <laughs> but like, let's just take an example, right? Okay, let's say you are a LGBTQ filmmaker and you have the opportunity to get your film on iTunes, sure. But let's say instead you go with the company like Reverie. Reverie, Reverie yeah. is Reverie's a streaming hot. platform for LGBTQ stuff. And like they will appreciate your content so much more than Netflix that's trying to fill a quota of having this much LGBTQ stuff on their platform. So, you know, the people that are on Reverie are gonna just naturally like your stuff more. Like everybody is a potential audience member versus you might have maybe 5%, 10% of people on Netflix that would even be interested in yours, but there's only so much screen and attention real estate for any platform. Yeah. Like you look at Netflix's front page, like 
how many films are they showing you? Like 200 at the most, if you scroll all the way down? Yeah, right. That's just a fraction of their library. So are you going to be on there? Probably not. But you might be on the front page of Reverie. Yeah. And Especially if you cool. played Outfest, right? Or one of the top, you know, festivals in that in that genre. Yeah, it's funny you bring up Reverie. Um, so I've got NDA stuff about this, so if I stumbled through this. But the short version I can talk about is that like <clears throat> I've been talking to them about stuff i guess is it <laughs> about uh, crowd money i know they just 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 to cut you off really quick to protect your nda that there was a big announcement yesterday they just closed a huge round of seed funding i'm not connected to that so i think i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> at least i haven't got my check yet um the, the, there you the go i was really trying to get it's to, coming soon Right. As we, as I talk to like the CEO and some of the top brass over there about some of the stuff we've got cooking up, what I hear is the passion to connect filmmakers to their audience. And like, I don't know if you're getting that in the bigger oceans. I don't know if, 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 you know, Bezos is hopping on Amazon and going like, man, it's so great. We get to do it. And like, that's what this company is doing. And so their audience is super loyal, super excited, and you're starting to see breakouts uh, from their project that are getting into the ocean because they just they became too big of fish for their pond anymore, and it was time to time to free Willie out into the world. <laughs> you guys, it just keeps it just working, it Justin. really does. <laughs> you see, I have the ocean behind me. Oh yeah. There you go. It's all full circle. We planned all of this. This is all scripted. <laughs> I have a map here. There's oceans on this map. I have weird construction. Justin's in Kentucky. Right. He's heard of oceans. Heard of- let's 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 uh let's <laughs> let's connect the dots even further and take this to the data question, mm-hmm. which I know is on everybody's mind as the plane towers over my head. Mm-hmm. Um the idea of festivals tracking data and demographic information and just about every panel we did at the festival Mm -hmm. last year um, with both you guys, Paul and Justin, I remember it coming up where we asked the question, the survey too, like, would you provide data to filmmakers that could be valuable for them? Right. If I can play my film in a festival and I know that a hundred people saw it that were over 50 and 70% of them were male and they all gave it a four out of five star rating. That, that is that helpful in my conversations with distributors? It seems like that's something everybody kind of wants. And you got a lot of festivals that are saying, you know what? I, I don't, we're just trying to hang on for dear life. We don't have time to put together and research and package and provide that kind of information. But it seems to me, and you start talking about, fans and filmmakers connecting with fans. And, and I think data is, is got to be part of that conversation, right, Paul? Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody wants the data, mm-hmm. even if they don't know what to do with mm-hmm. it. So, you know, we're, we also don't know what to do with this. So we're just trying to collect as much as we can, like how much has somebody watched something? How, when did they pause? How many people are rating this thing? How many people are even finishing this thing? We have a completion percentage which can be a kind of depressing percentage when you look at it like if a lot of people generally stop at like 50 percent through the movie that's pretty rough yeah. um so sometimes we don't share that data with people because <laughs> it'll make them feel bad but you can't do that at a live at festival, right it's harder to walk out in a full theater yeah people get pressured into staying <laughs> If only there was a way to. I was just going to say the pinnacle of cinematic experience. I've been pressured into watching the entire thing. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, I. I, For me, the data I would love to have. I just wish festivals would have like a little box that says, "Is it okay if we, you know, smoother way of saying, is it okay if we share your contact info, your email, with the filmmaker." of the thing or filmmakers of the block that you're watching or the film that you're watching so that like I could actually reach out to my audience and say, Hey, thanks for watching. And you know, here's what I've got coming up next. Or if you want to follow along as we go through more festivals, here's our social media pages. Um, 
you know, I'm sure some people will be silly and, 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 and unprofessional about that. But I think for all the filmmakers who really are intent on building out a career, being able to interact directly with their audience would be so incredibly valuable. And if you make it an opt-in feature at the festival, then at least that initial email is welcome. Um, and then they can unsubscribe if they don't like it. But, uh, I don't, I don't know why that's not a thing. Well, Paul, why is that not a thing? I mean, you have a festival. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you would be, you would be appalled by how protective everybody is of emails. Like even with that, like people don't even want to offer that as an option because they're so scared that somebody is going to get added to some list that they didn't want to be a part of. Like we run into this problem, I would say, you know, at least twice a week of somebody saying, you're not sharing emails with anyone, right? Please confirm like via email that you will absolutely not share your emails, our emails with anybody. And I'm like, dude, like, I don't, what am I going to do with your emails? Mm -hmm. This is like festivals are coming and, you know, people have to get access to the platform and we have, you know, those emails because they're on Filmocracy, but for people that are attending your panel, it's just, it's just a very sensitive subject for people i think and i think over the past five years people have gotten even more protective of their personal information much more than before mm -hmm. like 10 years ago when people were just kind of like signing up for things mm -hmm. left and right because emails seemed like this free thing that they could just use and now we've just all gotten and if you look up like those statistics of like how much spam gets sent every day like billions of spam emails per day like this is why people are getting more protective and i think actually what you're saying justin is a good idea um, but i'm i understand why it has not happened mm. because people are just generally fearful of that kind of yeah stuff. i think i think the opt-in's an interesting play you know you know what this kind of comes back to is one of the reasons why and Chris Gore used to talk about this all the time from Film Threat, why, why it's important for filmmakers to play a lot of festivals, and this is pre-COVID, but was it was a marketing vehicle. It was an opportunity for you to get out into communities and show your film. And if you're hustling and if you're getting radio interviews or you're getting some PR, uh, maybe you're the film that they do a little blurb for the local newspaper, um, if you're lucky enough to win an award or you know, if, you, if you're if you're doing the right marketing and you're driving audiences to the to that movie, the, the idea is to build word of mouth for your movie, and hopefully, it, it can be seen at some point in the near future by ge the general consumer, right? So if you're playing festivals for six months or a year, you're generating some buzz, and you're you know you're kind of out in the in the world, as it were. Sorry, there's another plane waiting for the plane. Hold for plane. Hold for plane. Um, no, but the idea of marketing and, and it's just like another level, right? When you talk about email, capturing email addresses and being able to, to reach out to, to, to fans, right? And tell them when the movies be released. I, I mean, almost every Q and A you ever, you ever do, right? You want to tell the audience when the film's going to be available for them, you know, for their friends to see, right? Or so they can go watch it again or whatever. Um, it's harder to do that now. Um, but Paul, tell us a little bit more about the idea of, let's say I'm a filmmaker and one of the things that, that I really like about film festivals is the opportunity to have a Q&A and engage with, with the community. If, if, I'm, if I'm doing something with one of the Filmocracy Fests, they do these Q&As virtually, right? And there's conversations and there's chat. And if they want to stay in touch, like the filmmaker has an opportunity to throw their email in in the chat. Do you know what I mean? So there is that interactive component, even though it's not, you know, shaking hands, you know, in the aisle after the film. You want to talk about that a little bit just as a technology component? Yeah, I think the, the, the live Q&As is really, really important, especially when we're going virtual. It's very easy to like, default to like, oh, that's pre-recorded and it's just easier for everybody. But in reality, I think we're losing so much already by being virtual instead of physical that going even that step further to just being a pre-recorded Q&A, like, do people really want to watch a pre-recorded Q&A or would they rather just go to YouTube and watch something else? Right. Like, 
if I can feel like I'm participating、mm. in something, this is the key. Like, am I just a passive person fly on the wall, or am I there? And that's what is important now, and it's becoming more important. And festivals and filmmakers are asking for more and more interactive features, like. You know, can I bring people on the stage to ask me a question, like face to face, or is there a way to get like some emojis popping up on the screen so I know that people、uh, are actually paying attention? And so that's it's part part something that you have to learn also as a presenter, but also something you have to have the tools to do. So filmocracy provides a lot of those tools of being able to like face to face or have comments and things like that. But as a Presenter online, you also have to kind of like engage people yourself. And so I was watching this like marketing webinar with this guy, and he was kind of annoying me, but he did a really good job of getting people to participate. Because so he would say things like,、uh, "Blah blah blah." If you guys agree with me about this, just type yes in the chat. And then you'd see like yes,、yeah. yes, 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 like people typing all the time. And small activations like that. Because when you're in a theater and you're doing a live Q and A, like you already get that sort of visceral feel of like I'm sitting here, he's right in front of me, we're intimate. But in the virtual space, it's much harder to be intimate. So the only things you can do are basically like force the engagement and interaction. And so simple things like just asking questions to your audience is very impactful. Virtual. That reminds me、uh, with the Clubhouse app. <clears throat> I finally did a room the other day. And、uh, I guess there's this thing where you mute yourself and unmute yourself really fast, so that the circle around your icon blinks in and out really fast, and that's applause. That's that's that platform's form of applause. And so I found that really really fascinating because for once I could do a thing and I could see like real time emotional response. Um, and and I would love to see something like that as well in in this virtual space. Like, can people clap? Can people cheer? Can you know the old school emojis on the lives kind of thing?、Uh, little floating hearts, letting me know that you know people care. Like, well, one of the things that 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 I think we didn't really talk much about today, Paul. But to that point, Justin, the idea of of rating and reviews, right? One of the things you always said at the end of your Q and A was, "Don't forget to vote," right? You, right. you want a chance at the audience award. Well. I, Filmocracy has this rating and review system, and part of what you're trying to get out of this festival play is is feedback from the audiences, right? So, if you can't go live but you're still looking for feedback, isn't that some information that you could provide? The the ratings and reviews. Yeah, yeah. Those are we provide all that data to the festival, and then the festival sort of decides how they disseminate it. Um, but on Filmocracy itself, obviously we have our own streaming for movies that are not in festivals, and that data we are collecting. We haven't built a, a user interface yet for the filmmakers to go and see that data, but definitely that will be coming in the future, so people can see even you know over time if people are starting to like their film or maybe in specific seasons you've hit a hit a nerve for for your film. So that data play. You know, we're trying to democratize film, and providing transparent data is something that we really want to do. Very、Yay. cool. Very Democracy. Cool. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for Paul. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right, Justin. I think I think we covered the bases I wanted to、yeah. try and cover today. I don't know if you had any other any other thoughts or. Oh, we I've got plenty a little of bit thoughts. About- <laughs> we were talking a little bit about,、um, you know, when we when we post these podcasts on Wednesdays, of kind of getting the word out, and and also just letting our community know that 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 this platform that Filmocracy is using will allow for hundreds of users to actually join us live for for these presentations. So we're going to encourage that starting next week.、Mm-hmm. Um, So I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe just that, just that we're going to include a link、um, for Film Festival Mastery. We have a free masterclass on sort of the need to know basics of film、uh, film festivals. And so, if you're a filmmaker and you're listening to this and you haven't seen that yet,、uh, go to filmfestivalmastery.com/slash/masterclass. Watch that.、Uh, 
Um, and then uh, you'll be on our resource list, which basically means whenever we have cool stuff, we'll shoot you an email with that stuff. Obviously, you can unsubscribe if you don't want to do that. But uh, every Wednesday now, we're going to start sending out um, a podcast. And in that email, we'll, we will include a link to the live podcast that we'll be doing the next day on Thursday. So if you want to get into that, uh, if you've already seen that masterclass, you're good. You don't need to do this. But if you haven't, um, it's a good primer and a good foundation to bring into this podcast anyway. Um, and then, uh, and then, like I said, you'll get cool resources from us uh, when we have them to share. <laughs> you were just waiting for me to finish, weren't you? Just with bated breath, <laughs> finger hovering over the button. <laughs> a well-timed sound effect is worth yeah. so much. Any final thoughts, Paul, on your side? Any any festivals that you want to plug coming up? Festival on the filmocracy. Uh, well, we have the Film Threat Awards ah, coming go. up, which we are hosting, and that will be quite an experience. So definitely, you know, come to Filmocracy and look at our virtual events row, and you'll see Film Threat there. Um, and we have a few returning film festivals that are here for their second season. Always very exciting to have returning customers. Um, and yeah, we're upgrading the platform constantly. There's this new feature yeah. here that you can see if you hit that button at the bottom, it shows who's in the audience is kind of like displaying at the bottom. And then there will be the thing that you just talked about, Justin, where emojis can sort of like float up on the screen and make Yay. people feel nice. So a lot of random changes happening, but uh, at the end of the day, you're coming to get the content, and that comes from John's brain, <laughs> Justin's brain, and my mouth. And Paul's here, too. <laughs> and he and exists, I, I exist. also. Um, thanks, guys. This is always fun. I was, you know, love talking about this stuff because I think it's practical stuff that can actually help filmmakers do their career so i um, honored to be a part of it and uh you guys rock and i'll see you next week and peace out everyone all right thanks justin bye paul bye guys yeah there we go there we go Play it out. <laughs> Play it out. all right peace bye